Uh, welcome to my first live stream for the iTag bottom up uh, drop shoulder tutorial. Um, we're just getting started. So, this is the first question and answer session. There are several questions already over on Ravelry. If you are tuning in and you're not sure what we're talking about, this is about the iTag bottom-up drop shoulder tutorial that I have available on Ravelry. I'll put a link to it down in the description below the video once this uh, live stream is over. So hello everybody! It's so good to see you! Um, I've been watching on Ravelry and a lot of you are getting some gorgeous swatching done. It's very, very exciting to see your work and you have some really good questions. And behind the scenes, I've been working on some new material for you. In fact, I uploaded a video. It's taking forever for YouTube to finalize it. But there's a video that will be available probably shortly after this live stream's over on taking measurements for a variety of body sizes for this tutorial. And then following that will be a video on how to put the measurements on your schematic and how to adjust the schematic. And then the, the one after that is how to calculate the yardage uh, that you'll need for the project from your swatch and your schematic. And then I have a bonus tutorial on how to make a sloper and adjust the sloper to fit your body better. So all of that's going to be coming up later today. It just takes time. Um, I actually did all of the video work a few days ago, but it takes a bit to get the editing done um, to the way I want it. So hello, everybody. Let's see who's on here. Bunches of people. Yay! Anne Tremolies, Renee, Alma Rose, uh, Francois, hello, Luana Hendricks, Mary Inman, Dolise, hello, Dolise, Kelly, my cat, Calming Water 81. Uh, Vincentia Dennis from Australia. Nancy Creedmore, hello, Nancy. Leslie Dunn, Jerry Rossiter, Marlene, Roxanne, Julia Fatima from Portugal, hello. Sylvia Earl, Diane Eddy, Elizabeth Nilsson, Amy Peters, hello. Kurt from New Zealand. I tried to get him to come on here today, but. His hair isn't just right, so he couldn't. Um, and a bunch of other people. Thank you for joining me today. If you do have a question that you'd like to ask, and I will answer any question that I'm able to, uh, just put the word QUESTION in all caps in the chat. Put QUESTION all caps followed by your question. And then I'll, uh, it's easier for me to see. If I miss your question, it's okay to ask it again because sometimes there's so much chat going on that I might miss it. So first of all, I want to talk a little bit about um, designing a bottom-up garment. And uh, the first one I ever made. And pitfalls to be aware of and why I teach the way I teach. So the very first one I ever made was, this is out of made out of Carabella Aurora 8. And I made it a long, long time ago. It's got a funnel neck. It's a great big, huge cabled sweater. It's knit from the bottom up. And um, I still had the same sense than I do now. I wanted the cables just to emerge out of the bottom of the sweater. This is the bottom of the sweater. And so this, cinch, this is actually the middle of the back, I think, where this cable comes down. I brought it right down through the ribbing. And the legs of the cables, I just brought them down. So the ribbing flows right into the sweater. Do you see that? That was really important to me because I just, it blows me away. I'll see a ribbing and then it's like it was just cut off and a new fabric started with no relationship to the ribbing. And I don't care for that look. On the sleeves, I did the same thing. I started the cables right out and took them into the ribbing into the cables. So here's, you can see how this ribbing turns into 
the little skinny cable, and then there's the fat cable. Do you see how the legs go up and become part of the cable? And I actually put increases in here inside the cables to do the increases for the sleeve so the sleeves gets wider and wider and wider. In fact, on this one, and I knew nothing about designing, absolutely nothing. The inside of this one. So here's the cuff. And you'll see how this cable right there, it starts as ribbing right here, this ribbing right here. Follow this one. And it turns into a little skinny cable right there. And then that cable gets wider and wider as it goes up the sleeve. You can do the same thing by working top down. You would just do decreases in the cable section there. You would just decrease away till you get skinny again. So one of the pitfalls of this sweater was that I knitted it in the round. I didn't know about knitting flat for sweaters. This was one of the very first sweaters that I knitted. And so it's knit in the round. And I did this cable design all the way around. But I didn't balance it, the front and the back, the same. They are balanced. The front is balanced, so there's a big wide cable goes up the center of the front. But on the back, it worked out so that one of the skinny cables went up the center of the back. That's all fine and dandy. But when you get up to the shoulders, nothing matched. In fact, where I put the sleeves in, let's see, this is the front. So you can see where this sleeve goes in. This is the sleeve here. Here's the sleeve. Here's the body of the sweater right here. And the sleeve is seamed right here. So you can see that there's this cable, the skinny cable, whoops, it's reverse. I'm not very good at doing reverse, let's see. You see this skinny cable right here? That's on the body of the sweater. This is on the body of the sweater. This is where the sleeve is seamed in. That's on the front. On the back, it turned out that the skinny cable was right on the very edge and here comes the sleeve out there, see? And the sleeve is seamed right here. So the front and the back do not match and that creates a problem up here at the shoulder. Here's the neck. This is the shoulder from the back. You see the two skinny cables here on either side? Skinny, skinny. This way. Here's the front, here's the neck, the shoulder. There's one skinny cable coming down. Do you see that? Right here. So they don't match. So I didn't know, what am I going to do at the shoulder? That's going to look horrible. Saddle. That's where the saddle came in. I figured I'll just do a saddle from the sleeve this is the sleeve. This is the middle of the sleeve coming up. I just made this go right up and turn into a saddle and go right into the neck. So it looks like it was meant to be that way. And that disguises the fact that the shoulder doesn't match. This is horrible trying to get myself there. I have to do it this way. That's the saddle, and you can see that this body does not match this body in any way. But the saddle disguises that fact. So it was a great learning point for me. I learned I don't have to worry about the front and the back matching if I use a saddle. Now, because I added the saddle after the fact, it did make my armhole a lot deeper. And I'm not happy with that, but this is an oversized sweater anyway, and so the armhole's like two inches bigger around than it would have been without the saddle, but it's, I wear it. In fact, I have to wait for really cold days, but I do wear this. So this was one of my very first original designs, 
And I did use Ann Bud's book, Bottom Up, but I wasn't aware of the saddle until after the fact, and I had to plug it in there. So that's that sweater. This sweater is what we're knitting this time, because this is, this is an example of what you can knit. This is knit in pieces. This is the back. So it's got seams up the side. And the sleeves are, um, it's drop shoulder. There's no armhole shaping. There's the front. So this is what we're going to do this time. But you're going to use your own designs. So let's see if anybody's asked any questions so far. Probably not yet. Now, um, in uh, Dolise pointed out to me a few minutes ago via a text that in on page four of the tutorial it says that the live streams are going to be at noon. It's two o'clock, and I'm sorry for that. I hope that that didn't inconvenience anybody, but they are going to be at two o'clock. That just works better for me, and I will change that in the directions when I do part two, which is going to come up this coming week. So let's see. And while I'm thinking, going through these names, I see Kurt's name again. Didn't you all love that interview with Kurt? Oh my gosh. That guy is talented. Okay, let's see. I don't see any questions. Oh, here's one from Anne. Is it okay to ask questions which are not related to the knit along? You can ask anything you want, but if I don't have an answer for you, that's okay. I don't know everything. Okay. Hello from Lancaster. Helen Henry. Hello. You should come over here to Bakersfield. Lancaster's maybe about like less than 80 miles from here, I think. Oh. Does somebody have a blurry screen? I hope I'm not causing a blurry screen. On my end, it looks clear, but... Um, I'm seeing the real thing. Let's see. Here's a question from Christina Chris Ma. If I knit a sweater for someone who wears slim fit, do I go with 5% or ease or none at all? I assume some ease must be considered for moving at shoulders and chest. That's a great question. I, uh, to me, slim fit means I would get their measurements as suggested in the tutorial. It means probably that they're taller, not that they're that you're going to use less ease. It's probably means you're going to make them longer because usually slim fit. Like I would be probably be considered slim fit because I'm five foot ten, and I wear like a size ten in clothing, which is really hard to find because they never make anything long enough. That's why I love to knit for myself. I make the sleeves two inches longer. I make the body two inches longer, but I use the standard fit for my circumference. So that's slim fit. I would not use less or more ease than what the person likes. I would go by their circumferences and then be sure to measure their lengths because actually what you're creating is a custom made pattern for that person. This is from me. That was an excellent question, Chris. Nina. Question, can you try on the blue sweater so we can see how it fits? Very curious. Yes. Okay, let's see. So here you can see, whoops, my rug got smished up. Okay, here you can see the saddles and how it just goes down the sleeve. What I don't like is the depth. It's not horrible. It's just baggier. It made my sleeve bigger than what I would have liked. But it's not horrible. I really like it. And another thing that I like about drop shoulder with a saddle is drop shoulder creates a very boxy square. There's no shoulder shaping here whatsoever. It's perfectly square at the top like this. But what by adding a saddle, 
it gives you that rounded edge. So my sleeve, but this isn't, I'm sorry, this isn't a drop shoulder, it's a set in sleeve, but it has the saddle to it. But still, the saddle creates this rounded thing that goes around your shoulder and gives a nice look. It's the same thing in this sweater. Okay, so now I'm gonna strip. Let me put the green sweater on and show you, because it is drop shoulder. There goes my hair. Okay. The green sweater. I have it buttoned, so I'm going to put it on over my head. This is a drop shoulder. It's not modified. It's flat out drop shoulder and no shoulder shaping. Okay, so you can see the body goes clear out to here. Now what disguises that is that I have just the cabling here and out here I have moss stitch. But what makes the shoulder look nice is that saddle. The saddle here is two inches wide. See my saddle? So the saddle goes like this. It's still on the body. The sleeve doesn't start till right here. This is where the sleeve starts. You see that? But what the saddle does, it makes this nice transition so you don't get that square boxy look. You see that? Isn't that cool? I love saddles. It makes all the difference in the world. It, it just pulls the design together. Okay, so... This is from S. Croom. Question, oh my god, did I miss the initial purchase of the pattern? I'm sorry. It's $25, but it's worth every penny. Uh, you will definitely get your money's worth. And I've sold quite a few of them, and people are continuing to buy them at $25. So, And the people who've done my previous tutorials can vouch that, that you will get your money's worth, way more than your money's worth. This is Juliet Nash. Question, can I knit this without doing cables? Yes. You can use any stitch pattern you want. You could do this whole thing in just stockinette, or you could do um, uh, seed stitch, or you could do garter stitch. You, it could be extraordinarily simple. It's the principles of learning how to fit your body and how to create a garment really without a pattern. If you follow along in all my tutorials, the way that I teach knitting is to start with a swatch, get your gauge, draw a picture of what you want, a schematic, put your measurements in the schematic, and then you're knitting to the schematic. I knit almost everything to a schematic. I don't follow line-by-line -line directions. Once you learn how to create a garment and start with your body measurements and then your swatch and go on to um, creating your schematic, that's all you need. And you could knit it bottom up, top down, sideways, however you want, once you have the schematic. So that's how I teach about knitting. I've done three. This is the third one. We started out with um, a raglan, and then we did a yoke. Now we're doing drop shoulder, bottom up. The next one's going to be set in sleeves, bottom up. And that, it'll be a complete series of four. Um, if you follow all four of those tutorials, you should be able to make any garment you want that will fit you perfectly, or any other person who's the recipient of your knitting. So this is from Serena. Question, do you have a video for measurements waist, back, neck to hip, front neck to hip, bust points from center, bust point depth from the shoulder? Actually, I do. I have several, one for each type of the sweaters, and I created one this past week for this sweater that actually is uploading to YouTube as we speak. And the last I checked, it was still processing. It takes a while because it's, it's like a 30 minute video. Kurt Payne says, slim fit may be measure an existing sweater the person you're knitting for likes to wear. Exactly. 
Let's see. Nina says, thanks, that is so helpful. I never like those baggy underarms. I want to be able to eliminate that. Wait till you see my video. I show all about that. Anne, question. When you have a background of stockinette and you purl some stitches on the right side, vertical purling lines are backward lines, whereas horizontal lines are forward. Why? This is a great question, Anne. So when you work ribbing, you knit two, purl two. The purl two sink down into the fabric, right? That's because when you make a transition from a knit to a purl, the yarn goes to the back. That pushes the stitches backwards. The um, uh, stockinette stitch wants to curl like this. So this is, let me get my board out here. Let me find my marker. I know it's here. I just used it. There it is. And my eraser. Okay. That's a great, great question. When you make a knit stitch, it looks like this. And here's the neighboring neck stitch, right? And a knit stitch over here. Which part do you see on the front of the work? You see this part right here, right? And the purl bump part goes to the back of the work. So the purl bump is pushed to the back. The legs are pushed forward. So when you change from a knit to a purl, just that directional changes in a row causes the purl to go to the back when you do one on top of the other. So you're going to do Okay, you're just going to see the legs. See how the pearl bumps go to the back behind the legs? Now think about stockinette. Think about how when you knit a, just a panel of stockinette, the, it curls to the back, right? You have the stockinette and the edges are going to curl to the back, correct? But the top and bottom curl forward. Let's see if I have, I don't really have a, this is a good example. This is a little piece of stockinette. See how the top is curling down? And these, the sides curl back. So if you are knitting rows of pearls across, the stockinette curls to the back and the pearls pop forward because the stockinette wants to curl like this. That makes the pearl, the stockinette goes down in the ditch and the pearls come forward. But if you're knitting columns of pearls this way, then you have this effect happening in that the stockinette curls to the back, it pushes the stockinette forward, it pushes the pearls back. Does that make sense? So if you're knitting rows like this, a pearl, like you're doing garter stitch or you're doing, um, you know, like two pearl rows and two knit rows and it kind of makes that uh, like, um, I don't know what you call it, but you know what I'm talking about. So you can see that the force, because of the way the stitches are created, stockinette wants to curl this way and this way. So the stockinette gets pushed back just because of the curl and the pearls will come forward. Whereas when you have columns of pearls, like in ribbing, you have the force of the stockinette on the edge wants to curl back, pushing the knits forward and the pearls back. Okay? That was a good question. Okay, Diane Danko, question. I know it's my knitting, but I have a lace panel going up the center of my back. Would it still look okay if I split it in half for when I make my friends? Yes. It well, depends on the uh, lace pattern that you're doing. You might have to add something to it. Um, 
depends on the width of it. If it's very, very narrow, it's not going to give you much of a pattern on the front, but if it's a wide lace panel, splitting it in front would be lovely. And in fact, if it's one of those directional ones like this, wouldn't that be pretty? Okay. Let's see. Deborah Cisnero says, hey, I didn't get notified, but here now. I want to tell you, if you have subscribed to my YouTube channel, and then when I post these, I post them on Facebook and Ravelry a day in advance or more. If you hit that link, the advanced link, and go to the video, there's nothing to see because I haven't started it yet, but you can hit the reminder button. Also, if you have subscribed to my channel, you need to be sure to hit the little bell. It looks like a little bell and that it's vibrating. That means that notifications are turned on. So it looks like this. If you see a little bell like that and you, you've clicked on it and now it looks like that, that means you will get notifications every time a video comes up. But you'll only get the notification when the video comes up. If you want to be notified uh, in advance, you have to hit that Remind Me button when I link the video. Okay, Serena Burhan's question, final swatch. It says on page 14, says create another swatch four inches wide, but doesn't say four inches long. It's four by four. Create a four by four swatch because what you're going to use that one for is calculating your um, yardage of yarn that you're going to need. Okay. Let's see, Fatima says, comment. I have not yet questions. I'm still very confused what to do. However, I will do some sweaters soon. Thanks for this lesson. You'll get it. The starting part is the hardest, um, and that's where the most work is. And if you do the work and you do the swatches, do the measurements, then your sweater will turn out just lovely. So, Serena, question. Is it typical to make some of the stitch patterns with different size needles? Background size and size 5, cable stitch in a different size. You can do that, but it would be really awkward in your sweater. That means you're going to be knitting your sweater with different needles for different sections, and I, I don't know that that would work out. I gotta take this off. It's too hot! Okay. So basically you want to, and that leads me into uh, some good discussion here. Um, you want to be able to use the same needle throughout your sweater. This is an example. I don't, let me count the stitches. That's probably 21, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. It's 30. Okay. This is a swatch. It's 30 stitches wide. And the bottom portion is just seed stitch. Then this middle portion is moss stitch, and the top portion is double moss stitch. It's all 30 stitches. Can you see the difference in the size of the fabric? So this is seed stitch. This is moss stitch. This is double moss stitch. I'm sorry that it's the light is making it too bright, but you can see that the width varies. Okay. This is all done with the same yarn, same size needle. So this is why you do gauge swatches. For example, if you were going to have a sweater that had the seed stitch and the double moss stitch, you'd either have to change needles at this point, to, so this was equivalent to this, or you'd have to add or subtract stitches. In this case, you would have to add stitches. That is, this is called stitch equivalency. So in order to maintain the equivalence of the width of the fabric and or rows, for some things it's rows too, you would either have to change your needle, get larger to get the, so this fabric's bigger, but it wouldn't look so good bigger, I don't think, or add stitches when you make that change so that the width of the fabric stays the same. That's called stitch equivalency, and I have some more swatches to show on that in a second. I have a bunch of things out here to show you. So basically you want to stick with uh, pretty much the same needle size throughout, otherwise you're creating a headache for yourself. Chris Ma, 
With stretchy patterns like cables or brioche for the body of the sweater, the pattern should have ease for shaping. Would I still make the standard swatch size to check for ease? You make the stand, you, I make pretty large swatches. Um, I don't have, I didn't bring my big swatch bag in here. By the way, you know I make all those videos, so these are all my, I have hundreds, hundreds of little samples that I knit. This is just one bag of many. I don't have any of my bigger swatches in here. But I often will make them at least six inches wide and sometimes wider. The length isn't quite as important as the width. The most important, of course, is stitch gauge, whether it's stitch or row. Gauge is most important. But in most cases, the stitch gauge is more important than the row gauge. So um, you, that's why in the beginning of this tutorial, the first swatches I have you make are good size swatches. Then when you want to figure out, once you've figured out the needle size that you want to use and the swatch and the stitch pattern you want to use, then you need to knit a swatch in that stitch pattern with those needles to uh, do your calculations for how much yarn you're going to need for your sweater. Dimitri says, oh Alma says, how do we find your first class to this series? This is the first class to this series. So you found it. But if you go to this my YouTube channel, this one is Suzanne Off the Cuff, you'll see lots and lots of other videos about other sweaters where I do questions and answers. I also have my other channel that's called Knitting with Suzanne Bryan, and that's where I do the small, shorter tutorial, stitch tutorials. This channel is specifically for live streams, most of them lasting an hour or longer. People who like to watch short tutorials don't like long live streams. And I learned that the hard way. So I have two channels, one for the short tutorials, one for the live streams. So you don't have to be bothered by one or the other if you just want a certain type of information. Demetria says, oh, hello, Demetria. A friend has never knit a sweater. Would this tutorial be doable for her? Yes. This is an excellent tutorial for a beginning sweater knitter. Chris Ma says, the first release of the Knit Along has 19 pages alone. So worth it. Read comments on Ann Bud's book, and they said it doesn't really talk about shaping. Ann Bud's book does not talk about shaping. Um, and you don't even, you don't have to have Ann Bud's book to do this. In fact, I don't use Ann Bud's book when I make my sweaters. But I have recommended that you get her books when doing these tutorials because it gives you the confidence that you are going to have a finished product. A lot of people, when they're just flying by the seat of their pants, it's too scary for them. And when they're just following along with me, they feel like they're flying by the seat of their pants, which is how I knit. But my knitting turns out fine, and I'm teaching you how to fly by the seat of your pants. But if that's too scary for you, then you get Ann Bud's book, and you can see that what we're doing uh, matches up and the sizing will fit, okay? Um, Dimitri says, oh no, yes, and uh, Chris says there's 19 pages just in the first section. Most of my tutorials um, are like a book. It's like writing a book on my part. And someday uh, when I feel up to it, I might combine them all together and make a book out of it. I don't know. Dimitri says, Alma, it's called It Takes a Guild Cardigan Tutorial, but I think you'll be okay starting with this one. Exactly. And this is Katharina Continental Combined. Hello, Suzanne. Hello, everybody from Berlin. Hello. Diane Villiers, question. Will this sweater have pockets? Yes. Yes, pockets on the front. And so we're not going to talk about those till we get to the front. That's another way that I do my knit-alongs. If I gave you all of the information in one go and you read about it, you would it would scare you off you'd feel, oh my God, I could never do this in a million years. But I give it to you in bite-sized pieces. For example, on this one, we're doing all the preliminary work and just knitting the back of the sweater for this lesson. The next lesson is still gonna be about the back of the sweater because 
just the back, there's a lot. And and the back is kind of the, the groundwork for everything else that you're going to do on the sweater. You get to test to see if you like the stitch pattern you chose. You get to see how it's going to fit on your body. You're going to see if you like the fabric. All of that before you invest any time in knitting the rest of the sweater. If you don't like it, it can always turn into a pillow top or a throw or something else like that. But you didn't waste your time knitting a whole sweater before you decided that you didn't like your stitch pattern. Okay. And you'll love the pockets. Maureen Rush. Hello, Maureen. Maureen lives down the street from me. The pattern I'm using has two front cables surrounded by stockinette. If I start the cable at the edge, will it curl up as a stockinette would tend to do without ribbing? The cables won't. In fact, um, I have some samples. Here is, I got different colored ones. So here is a sample of some ribbing with a cable that comes down through the ribbing. I use this for a different uh, knit along, but it works fine for this too. So if the stockinette, at some point you need to turn the stockinette portion into some ribbing, the cable can come all the way down to the bottom. Here's another example of a little cable coming down from stockinette. This is a little lacy cable, isn't that cute? All cables do not have to be knit to, purl to. They can be anything that includes knits and purls. If you have about equal number of knits and purls, the fabric will not curl on the edge. If you have all purls or all knits, yes, it is going to curl. Okay, I have some more. Here's another one, a little brioche ribbing. I, I'm particularly fond of brioche, so I just love that for ribbing. That was a great question, Maureen. Claudio. Hello, Claudio. Question, could you please explain the SSE numbers, and if you knit different SSEs on the same panel, how do you handle it? Good question. Let me get my little swatches out here. Okay. This swatch is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 18 stitches wide. Stockinette, uh, worsted weight yarn. And it's been blocked flat. It's 18 stitches wide. This swatch is also 18 stitches wide, but it has two cables in it. Because the cables pull the fabric in this way, it's much skinnier. See that? The stockinette sticks out that far. My hands are shaky. See the difference? So this is 18 stitches. This is 18 stitches. They are not equivalent, are they? So what you have to do is you have to figure out, okay, how many stitches am I getting to the inch on this? It's not the same as the stitches per inch on this, is it? Let's say we're getting five stitches to the inch here, but we're getting eight stitches to the inch here. That means eight stitches of this is equivalent to five of this. That's stitch equivalency. Eight of this equals five of this. So it, let's say this was 15 inch stitches wide just to make a multiple of five. This would have to be three times eight. This would have to be 24 stitches wide to be the same width. Does that make sense? And I'm going to show more about that in an upcoming video when we're doing, um, when I'm showing you how to check your, uh, create your yardage for your sweater. How to manage that because you've got your stitches, your swatches now for your different stitches. And some this one used a lot more yarn per inch than this one, doesn't it? So if we did our whole sweater out of stockinette, we would need a certain amount of yarn. If we did our whole sweater out of this, we'd probably need 50% more yarn because the cables consume a lot more yarn. That was a great question. Did that answer that? And you have to do that for every different stitch design. I'm using cables in this example, but it could be, this is stitch equivalency too. You would have to say, okay, this might be five stitches to the inch, and this is six stitches to the inch. So you'd say six stitches of this is equivalent to five of this. If I wanted it to be three inches wide, I would need 15 stitches here. If I wanted it to be three inches wide, I would need 18 stitches for this stitch pattern. That is stitch equivalency. 
Okay. Is it too late to purchase the tutorial? It's never too late. All of this information is kept and available to you at any time. These live streams that I do are taped and then I put them on YouTube and they're there forever. So you can always go back and watch them. And my wonderful friend, Diana Danko, watches every single one of these and creates timestamps that will be down in the description below the video. So you can see the topics that I discuss. And if there's a certain topic that you want to see, you just click on that time next to it. It'll take you to that part of the video. So you don't have to watch the whole darn video to get to one little part that you want to see. Okay? The time steps are wonderful. Someday I should make a video on just how to use my, my channel. Alma Rose, Ross, Rose says, question, I find it the hardest to come up with a pattern. So what do you suggest? Where can I go to find ideas? Um, one thing you can do is go to Google and put in knitting stitch patterns and search on that and then go to images and you'll see all these different stitch patterns and a lot of them will be have a link to where they found it. Another thing is to if you have any stitch dictionaries um, you know like this type of thing big book of knitting stitch patterns any stitch dictionary any stitch dictionary Barbara Walker now there's lots and lots of stitch dictionaries these are um, old old ones the harmony guides to stitch you know any stitch dictionary even just plain old vogue knitting has knitting stitches in it just look at them and and just i it's kind of like looking at a better homes and gardens magazine you just flip through the pages i i use post-it notes and i'll put little post-it notes on the pages of the patterns that i like and um if if you were here to see my library I'll pull some books out. See the post-it notes in the top? Those are there. My whole library is like that. All my books have post-it notes sticking out of the top of them. And I'll write notes on the post-it notes sometimes, like why I like that pattern or what I was thinking about. CSR Basketball. That's an interesting name. Question, is the pattern for a pullover as well as a cardigan? Yes, you can make a pullover or a cardigan or a vest. In fact, I'm making a vest this time, and it's going to be all double knit. I'm so excited. I'm um, playing with the colors, trying to decide which two colors I want to make. I might use four colors. This is from Vincencio Dennis. Question. Hi, Suzanne. In pages, page 18 of the tutorial regarding seaming between the back and the front, did you mean we have to add one extra stitch to each edge to allow seaming, and will it disappear after seaming? Exactly. Exactly. When you make the seam, here's the inside of my sweater. There's the seam. Can you see that? So that's one stitch from each side, and it goes to the, that's the inside of the fabric. Here's the outside. In fact, you can't even see my seam. You see the seam? I'll pull on it. You couldn't even see my seam. My seam is right here, okay? But it matches perfectly across the seam, and that's what I'm going to be teaching you to do. There's the inside. So that's those two stitches. One from each half is on the inside of the sweater. Excellent question. Nina, comment. Very interesting on that change of size with the different stitches. I'm getting better at making larger swatches to get a good measurement across for stitch patterns that pull in. Alma says, my bag of samples at school. <laughs> it's, it's a mess. It's a mess, but they're all there. Serena says, I'm swash exhausted, but it is a good exhaustion. It's totally transforming my approach. My fiber arts group thinks I'm crazy. Well, I hope you pass the swatching on because in my guild, when we first started it, nobody swatched but me. They all swatch now, all of them, because you cannot knit sweaters for yourself that fit without swatching. If you like to constantly be knitting sweaters for yourself that you end up giving to friends that they fit, don't swatch. 
But if you want it to fit you and look good, you have to swatch. Shirley Holcomb, when will this pattern go on sale? It's already on sale. If you go to Ravelry, it's called um, I-T-A-G, I-Tag. I-Tag stands for It Takes a Guild because we are a guild of people and we all come together and knit this sweater and every single person's will be completely different. There will be no two alike and it's so fun. Okay. Evelyn, question, could you show us what the sweater looks like? Which sweater? This is what we're going to be knitting, only yours won't look like this. Yours is going to look like yours. And we don't even know what yours looks like yet. Okay, it's still in your mind. This is mine, that's half the front. This is the other half. You can knit one like this if you want. You just follow the directions. Okay. Maureen Rush, do you have a favorite cast on for sweaters? I just use the standard cast on. Just, but I uh, sometimes I'll cast on in pattern. Marlene, question. I apologize because I think you addressed this before. We swatch to determine how much yarn we'll need for our garment. We also need to swatch with the same yarn and needles. How do we? And then that didn't go. The rest of it. Question, your green sweater has the non-cable sides to disguise the drop shoulder. Is there a good way based on measurements to determine how much to allow on each side to get that effect? It'll be in, in the video that I talk about the schematic. So you just watch that. I explain that in there. Marlene Kern, question, how much yarn to buy at the beginning? It's hard to say because I don't know what kind of stitch pattern you're going to use and how dense your fabric's going to be. That's where you can use Ann Bud's book as a good guide. Once you know your stitch gauge and the, and the size you want to make, she gives yardage in there. Kathy Bruno, I joined late, so if you already answered this, I will watch the beginning of the video. Do you know yet what kind of neckline and button band you'll be knit on your personal sweater? I'm just going to have a crew neck and I don't know if I'm going to have a button band at all because it's going to be double knit and it's just going to be a vest. But we don't need to think about that now. We've got plenty of time to think about that. You do, The back, uh, in a drop shoulder, the back of the sweater is going to be the same no matter whether you're knitting uh, a cardigan, a pullover, it doesn't matter. The only difference is, is whether you're putting a saddle in or not. And I'll be explaining that in the video on the difference between the saddle shoulder and the non-saddle shoulder. Okay. Amanda, question, I'm making a gradient sweater. Should my initial swatch be the whole length of the sweater? No. No. You could if you wanted to. Uh, but I don't think you need to. Um, if the yarns are equivalent in the weight, um, you know, yards per grams, um, you should be able to tell from just a swatch of any of them. If you're trying to figure out the percentage of yarn you need for each one, though, um, I would just do that mathematically. I don't think you need to knit a swatch of the whole thing. Serena says, if all else fails, Alma, keep it simple because there's no, so much to learn in this tutorial. I may only use two stitch patterns. Exactly. You could use no stitch patterns and learn a ton from this tutorial. You could knit your sweater in stockinette and learn a ton. Uh... I know Deborah says, do I have a tutorial on double knitting? I have tons and tons of videos on double knitting. All you have to do is look under Suzanne Bryan double knitting and they'll come up. Carla Monica, Suzanne, do you teach sweater courses anywhere or host any retreats I'd love to attend? Um, I am going to be, I don't know. I, I you know, I am really an introvert. 
Believe it or not, I am a huge introvert. I really like being in my house. <laughs> um, I love knitting, so I love to share about knitting. But as far as traveling and all that kind of stuff, it's just, it's kind of stressful for me, but it's something to think about. Diana Danko, question, as unlikely as it is, I'm knitting faster than you are releasing parts. Can I keep going? I've made this type of sweater before. I would wait, Diana, to see what I have to say. I'm going to be sending out some um, updates, you know, the uh, next section in the next in next week. I would wait so you don't miss out. But I know you're an excellent knitter, but, you know, you might want, you might catch, even if you learn one thing, it's worth it. It really is. Mary Inman, if we knit a vest, are we missing out on learning about attaching seaming in sleeves? No, not for a drop shoulder, but you're still going to learn seaming the shoulders and the sides, okay? Uh, Elena, my question, the slope is new, the sloper is new to me. Can you talk briefly about this? Yes. I'll te I teach you, and it's all in part one there. It's all in there, but I, I have a video to show you for people that like to watch videos. Um, you take your measurements, and you apply them to the schematic that I gave you in the directions. Then you take that schematic, and you move it on to life-size one-inch graph paper or gridded um, interfacing. One-inch gridded interfacing. So you transfer your markings inch by inch, onto the gridded interfacing. And then you cut it out, leaving a selvage. You pin that to some heavy t-shirt material, knitted uh, um, uh, jersey fabric. Cut it out and sew it up and try it on. And I have a video on that that should come out today, maybe tomorrow. It takes me a lot longer to load them up than I think it's going to. It always takes longer. You can count on that, but it's really good. It shows you how to make it, and after you make it, trying it on, how to adjust it. And then you move the adjustments that you make back to the pattern and back to the schematic, and then you knit from the schematic. Just like that. It's really cool. Let's see how much time we've been on here. We're almost at an hour. Answer. Let me answer a couple more questions on here, then I want to answer the ones that people asked over on Ravelry, okay? Serena, I'd like to add a second yarn for color. The main yarn is 100% wool. Can the second yarn be a blend? A second yarn can be anything you want. Anything. Don't let that constrain you. It can be a different weight. Just as long as they look good together, you've got to knit your swatches. If you knit your swatches and you like them, it's good to go. Diana Williams, my brioche always splays out way too much when I use it for ribbing. I use smaller needles and 50 per 15. Yes, I go down in brioche. I have to go down, like, let's say I used a 5 for the stockinette for this yarn. I'd probably go down to a 1 for the brioche. That's how much it splays. You have to go way down. Way, 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 way down. Again, swatching helps. Figuring out your stitch equivalency. Fatima, in a double knitting, are you seaming the vest? Yes, I'm going to I'm going to seam it because we're doing this tutorial. If I weren't doing this tutorial, I would knit it in one piece. But I'm going to show how to seam double knitting. Okay? Oh, the Japanese Knitting Stitch Bible. That's one of my favorites. Of course, I don't have it handy, but I have the one right after it right here. This is the second in the series. Okay. Um, yes, you find the picture you like, the pattern you like, and then you look at the chart, and then you go to the front of the book, and it has all of the directions for each of the symbols. Once you figure them out, they're pretty easy. And they're very graphic. You can pretty much tell from the symbol what you're supposed to be doing once you uh, read that. And I think there's a whole book on how to read knitting stitch patterns in Japanese somewhere. I have all of these. Whoops. I have all of these books right here. I'm just going to pull them out a little ways. All of these are Japanese stitch Bibles. Japanese stitch dictionaries. Each one of them is different. I love those books. Okay. Oh, my, and I'm on the boot camp. 
the boot camp is still in process. The biggest bugaboo on it is figuring out how people are going to pay me. Not that they won't pay me, but how am I going to keep track of it? Um, I'm trying to figure out a way on my web page to do it. It has to be secure, and I really want a way that when people buy it, they automatically get the boot camp. I don't have to manually send it to them. And how I'm going to correspond with people, because it's going to be a corresponding back and forth for me teaching you one-on-one. -on -one. Um, those are the things. I have the whole thing done. I've taught it for years. But it's a matter of um, those types of things. I tried working with a web page designer, but they didn't get the idea of what I was talking about. And, you know, it's just, it's on the back burner right now. Teresa Brown, will the yarn calculator that Ron created for the iTag cardigan be useful in determining how much yarn to buy for this sweater? Oh, it'll be similar. This one's way easier. You won't need a calculator. I'm show you in the video because it's square. Everything's square. It's really easy. Okay, Vincenzo, question. When we are ready to knit the back, how long should we knit for the length? Um, however long you want it to be, up to the top, but it depends on if you're doing a saddle shoulder or not. If you're doing a saddle, then you leave you knit it like one inch shorter. The saddle should be about two inches wide. Why should a saddle be two inches wide? Because the top of your shoulder is about two inches wide. You know, at the top of a set-in sleeve, how the top is about two inches wide? That's the same width that the saddle needs to be to go up, okay? So if you were going to knit with a saddle, you would knit your back one inch shorter than you would if you weren't doing a saddle. It's the only difference. Okay, so let me go over to Ravelry and get those questions. This is from Linda's Ayla18. Would it be possible to update the schematic? So what she wants is she's asking is on the schematics, on the tutorial, she wants me to put the letters here that go with here. And I will do that. On the update, those will come out. Yes, that's an excellent question. Thanks for asking it because it's an update that will make it better for everybody. This is from Jane Socks, and she wants to know if she wants to make a traditional Gansey, um, but a traditional Gansey has underarm gussets. And she wants to know if that would, you know, if she could knit it flat in pieces and seam it. I really, doing the underarm gussets in, doing it flat is not quite the same. Um, if you want to knit this in the round, you can knit it in the round, but you won't learn anything about seaming the sides if you do that. So it's up to you. You know, six of one, half a dozen of the other. This is from Moonrocker. And she really likes the Fair Isle PJs that uh, Elizabeth Zimmerman has, the uh, long leggings. And she's thinking about knitting them flat and seaming them. But I think that, and they're in Fair Isle, I think knitting them in the round is the way to go. But what Kurt was talking about in his video of joining the fabrics, like he does, uh, he uses a knitting machine and you could do Fair Isle on the knitting machine, but then you have to join it if it's going to be in the round, right? So he uses what's, it's technically a Russian join. And I have a video on that if you want to take a look at that to see how to do the Russian join. But I would knit them in the round. This is from LKO Girl. Do I need to adjust for cable flare even though my cables are after knit two purl two ribbing? Um, at the bottom, this is a good question. I'm glad she asked it. At the bottom of the garment, you do not need to adjust for cable flare because that's going to be at your bottom, right? And you want it to be able to be flexible around the bottom of your sweater. So you don't need to. You can just start knitting. But at the top, when you get up to the top where you're going to be seaming, yes, that's the top. There's my uh, um, saddle. When you get up here, this is where you are going to want to compensate for cable flare. Otherwise, this will stretch. Wait, see, it doesn't have any stretch. It's not because of the seaming. It's because how I bound off and compensated for cable flare because I wanted this to be rigid. You do not want your shoulder to, you know, go like this stretch way out of shape because then it just, it looks horrible. So we'll talk about that when we get to that part, okay? Oh, Kurt says the Gansey in his interview had gussets knit flat and seamed in. Well, send that information to me, Kurt, so I can learn about it. Thank you. Okay. 
half dozen question i do not have access to a local yarn store i order my yarn online and was wondering if you could discuss how to choose the perfect yarn based on description and reviews what i do if there's a certain yarn i'm interested in i can't touch it personally i go on ravelry and I look at people's projects. I look up that yarn, and then you can see thousands of projects in that yarn. Look at them. You can even ask people questions about, did they like the yarn? Um, you can see how the yarn is rated on Ravelry, um, things like that. Um, it's hard when you don't live near a local yarn store. I know, I understand that. We didn't used to have any yarn stores in Bakersfield. We have one now. And uh, so I would go to the uh, yarn shows, you know, the knitting, knit, uh, like, uh, stitches and stuff like that so I could touch everything I had to touch everything once you learn there's only a really there's not a huge number of yarn bases that people use it's just really kind of it is a finite number and once you learn the most of those then you have a better sense of what you're getting and you can buy sight unseen but in the beginning I understand it's very difficult okay so I have covered everybody's questions does anybody else have a question? I'll give you a few minutes. It's been one hour and 59 seconds. That's pretty darn good. It's so funny because when I first um, get ready to come on here to show these things to you and talk to you, I'm going, what am I going to talk about for an hour? Oh, my God. But it just goes by like that. Oh, my. Just it's so fun. Okay. Let's see if there's any more questions. Okay, so this coming week sometime, probably towards the end of the week, the second part's going to come out. Check for videos today and tomorrow. There's going to be um, more videos coming out. Oh, Maureen asked a question. She said, would you use acrylic yarn for sweaters? You can if you want. It's up to you. Um, Serena wants to know, this is a sport weight yarn. It's 100% merino, non-superwash. Uh, with a medium twist and I my local yarn store uh, Ron who's the owner of um, the twisted skein that's my local yarn store he dyed it for me the yarns for wool to dye for that yarn uh, distributor that distributes undyed yarn wool to dye for it's for wholesale and uh, he bought Ron bought the yarn for me and dyed it uh, for me. And then the colored yarn is from Van, uh, um, Anzula, her little uh, things with the sock yarn that have a variety of colors in them. You get like five different colors. I combined a couple of those with a couple of other fingering weight yarns that I used for the color work. In Okay, Demetria has a question. Oh, let me see. Hold on. Let me look here on Ravelry. She says, I'd like to make a vest for a friend who is very short and busty. She has thin arms and is unable to find vests with armholes that are not down to her waist. Yes, this is a, when you see, um, like within 30, 40 minutes, the video on taking your measurements should be up. And I address that exact thing in that video. So you can take a look at that. And you'll be able to make it fit her. Okay, so anything else? All righty. Kurt, send me that information. I love to learn. And we'll see you all next time. Next week, 2 o'clock on Wednesday, 2 o'clock Pacific time. I'll put up the video a little bit early, like the day before, and you can hit the reminder on it and also set your timer for yourself. But just know next Wednesday, 2 o'clock Pacific time, we'll be doing this again. Happy knitting. See you next time.